platformers, I would say most people would go ahead and think Mario, Sonic, Spyro, Crash, Plock. But there's a series that I find that people don't talk about all that often, and that would be the Oddworld series. If you go on YouTube and you type Oddworld into the search bar, you'll find videos that have millions of views, but they're mainly compilations of the game's cutscenes. So if people are out there looking for content, but the only content that's really widely seen is these cutscenes. Or you could also see, like, Catacris's videos about the Oddworld series from, like, four plus years ago. But even he has marked them as old. So, you know, like, why is it that something that is so unique and with a tale unlike anything I've ever seen before gone so far under the radar for all this time? Well, today I figured I would fix that, because I wanted to tell you the entire tale of the Oddworld franchise, and odds are, if you stick around, maybe you'll find something you enjoy. Hello. Hello everybody, I'm Garrilla64, and welcome to this video about me indulging in my personal nostalgia yet again. See, what I think happened was, after the Pikmin video, I was like, hey, wait a minute. There's another character from my childhood with, like, a suspicious stem growing out of their head that I would really like to talk about. Or, you know, I, I used to think he had a stem growing out of his head, but these days it's clearly feathers, but I guess PS1 limitations will just do that to you. Before we start though, I just wanted to say thank you so much for clicking on this video, and if you would do me the honor of liking, commenting, subscribing, and clicking the bell and all that stuff, it would really help me out a lot, and believe me, I'm not just saying that because I want to, because it definitely gets tiring, it actually helps the channel a lot, and this video, I think I'm definitely gonna need the help, because people don't know what Oddworld is, but that's why you're here, right? Oddworld is a series of mostly platforming games that started out on the PS1, brought to us by creator Lauren Lanning and Oddworld Inhabitants. I've said a couple times now that this game series feels unique to me, and it's still unlike anything else I've played to this very day, and I'm not quite sure why that is, because the concept isn't terribly, like, outlandish, I guess, despite the fact that it's very odd. Now, one thing that's important to know about the series is that it was always planned to be a quintology of games, which is five games for those who can't count. But thanks to some things that we will talk about later, that didn't exactly go as planned. But before we get to that, I think it probably makes sense to start at the beginning, with a game that's been rattling around inside my brain since the first time I was able to form coherent thoughts. Oddworld Abe's Odyssey for the PlayStation released in 1997, and to this day, it is the reason I have to think twice about how the word Odyssey is spelt. So, thanks for that. Being born in 1996 myself, I of course didn't play it until several years later, and out of my collection of PS1 games, Abe's Odyssey stuck out like a sore thumb amongst Crash Bandicoot and Spyro. The tone was so drastically different than anything I was playing at the time, and I remember vividly that that intro, which I have memorized along with most of the other cutscenes, would fill me with this heavy sense of foreboding and dread, and that was exactly the point once you learn the story. We of course follow Abe, since it's his odyssey after all. Abe is a Mudokan employed by the meat processing plant Rupture Farms, and if that name doesn't ring some alarm bells, just look at the place. It looks like they're ten minutes away from carving up their own employees with those saw blades. Oh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Yeah, so Abe's bosses, the Gluckens, notice that profits are way down after they've driven some of the creatures they're processing to extinction. So the head of Rupture Farms, Mullock the Glucken, realizes they're sitting on a gold mine of untapped potential, seeing as Mudokens are somehow 100% meat with no bones to be seen. So like any reasonable billionaire businessman, they unanimously decide to turn the entire workforce into tasty treats. But uh, pop quiz Mullock, who's gonna be left to process the meats if you turn the workers into the meats? Bada bing! Unbeknownst to the Gluckens, Abe was actually spying on their meeting because he wanted to see what the next product line was going to be, and instead of doing the sensible thing and placing the call to HR about this, he decides to go destroy the entire factory and free as many of his fellow Mudokens as possible. But since you're in control of Abe, technically you don't need to save anybody. But you know, actions have consequences, so you might want to watch out. Notice how the FMV cutscenes still look amazing even 25 years later? Well, check out the in-game graphics. It's a grungy, oil-painting-looking backdrop with pre-rendered player sprites to give it that perfect feeling of slight uncanniness. I could gush about how this game looks forever, and in some ways I think it still looks better than its remake, aside from some of the lighting possible with 17 years of hardware improvements. Abe as a playable character is a fragile little guy, probably thanks to the fact that he doesn't have any bones. Poor guy will just fall apart at the slightest violent explosion. So yeah, it's one-hit kills, but that works really well to sell how powerless Abe is in this world that's out to get him. Abe can run, sneak, hop a couple spaces forward, perform a running leap, throw rocks and bombs, and when faced with certain foes, he can channel his spiritual energy to possess them, which allows Abe to scout ahead certain areas and take advantage of the weapons they might be carrying. 
These green guys here are called Sligs, by the way, and I love them and all their stupid noises. Possession would always be an option though, seeing as Oddworld is mainly a stealth platformer where you've got to pay attention to enemy patterns and behaviors and either sneak by or find a way to destroy them so you can continue. Now, it might be possible to brute force certain sections, but Oddworld's other main gimmick ensures that you need to think about your moves before you make them. And one thing you should always think about is that Abe can uh, fart on command using a certain button, and this is the only series that I'll ever go to bat for that includes a fart button, I swear. And the fart button is actually part of the biggest gimmick of this game, that sounds weird. But Oddworld Abe's Odyssey introduces a feature called Game Speak, which lets Abe interact with his fellow Mudokans throughout the game. It goes like this. Casually approach Budokan, say hello, and then say, follow me. And thanks to the miracle that is social interaction, Abe can bring his chum to a bird portal and send them to their freedom. Sure beats being turned into a thinly sliced deli meat, I gotta say. This might sound like a simple concept, but Mudokans can't jump, climb, or think properly on their own, so Abe has to be diligent while leading or else they might become deceased. And there's only 99 workers in the game, so you can't let too many of them die, or else. This system is used for tons of puzzles where, for instance, Abe will have to toggle levers to turn off electricity fields or slow down meat grinders to get his friends to safety, and since you can only communicate with one fella at a time, just like in real life, you need to take your time. And since Abe's movement is designed to perfectly click with the concept of taking your time, the game ends up feeling amazing to work your way through. Be warned though, you will die in this game over and over and over and over again, but that's a thing that is supposed to happen, so you're actually playing the game correctly if that happens. Do be warned though, this is a game of trial and error mainly, and the original version is not that lenient with save points. So that brings me to my first point where I wanted to say, this is what I would call a save state game. And before you get on my case for being like a, a bad gamer or something, I wanted to mention almost every other game in this franchise includes a quick load and quick save feature, even the remake of this game. So I think they just hadn't thought of it for this title yet, so it is perfectly fine for you to use save states. Of course, you can set your own rules for that if you want to. You could save state once per screen. You could save state after you save Mudokens. It's really up to you to decide that, but basically, and I've talked about this set of games a lot on this channel, it's like the Mega Man Zero and Mega Man ZX collections. Because <laughs> in the original games, if you died three times, you'd have to redo the entire level or whatever to like get back to the boss, let's say, and then you would have to like think about how to fight the boss again all the way through the level, and then if you die three times, you gotta do it all again. And it's like, I get that like we're trying to pad things out a little bit by having a live system, but I want to improve at the game by fighting the thing that's actually giving me trouble. So save states, or in that game's case, those save points they added to like the rookie mode or whatever they call it, is actually a huge factor as to why I enjoyed those games so much the second time I played them. Oddworld is perfectly fine to play without save states as well. It's just you're going to be putting a lot more time into doing things that you've already done if you die and you haven't passed a checkpoint yet. And also, I'm not 100% confident in the checkpoints as a whole because I think in later revisions of the game, like on Steam, the checkpoints have actually increased in number, and you actually see when they're triggered. Abe's Odyssey is a fairly linear game, but frequently you'll take detours to access secret areas to save more Mudokans. Take level 2, the Stockyard. It felt like every 20 seconds I was jumping through a portal back into Rupture Farms to save two or three chumps to the point where I was just, like, getting some tonal whiplash. Like, I just escaped the plant, and you watch as the skies fade from this eerie radioactive green to a calming blue night sky, and after all the smog and industrial imagery, it is so serene looking. Not only do they nail the world building in the first level, they do it in every level. And I'm such a sucker for visual storytelling that this game is like a dream come true to me. Wait. After escaping the stockyards, Abe stares into the night sky for the first time possibly ever and sees the full moon that coincidentally has the same shape of his paw carved into it. But unfortunately, Sir Isaac Newton doesn't exist in Oddworld, so Abe is the one to discover gravity and fall damage. So he hits the ground and he's dead according to the voiceover, but a friendly big face is nearby to remind Abe that he's got infinite lives as he resurrects the Mudokan, telling him of his destiny to free his friends from the Gluckens. This involves first visiting the sacred Mudokan temples in Paramoni and Scrabania to prove that Abe is worthy of the power of his ancestors. From here you're able to choose which temple you visit first, which is a nice touch, but Paramonia is much less stressful so starting there would be best. Traveling to these lands isn't easy, however, since Moloch knows that one of his employees has gone rogue and has deployed his Sligs to shoot on sight. Though using some scattered bombs and help from Abe's new friend Elam, the Sligs aren't able to catch the Mudokan Savior as he arrives at the Paramonia Temple where things change a bit. 
This place is not as linear as the previous stages because the main chamber contains several trials you can complete in any order. All that's required of you in these chambers is for you to light the flint lock lever at the end of it and then you're able to move on to the next chamber. You'll of course be seeing more puzzles, but the paramites will definitely be getting in your way. These spider-like creatures seem harmless on their own. They'll just run away from you, but if you corner them, that's when they feel threatened and munch on your bones. They'll also become more aggressive if more than one is on screen, so there's a lot of luring them into different screens, distracting them with meat, or finding a way to kill these, uh, um, you know, very important and sacred wild creatures. That was kind of a weird choice, considering we're supposed to be pissed at the industrialists for harming these guys, but when Abe does it, it's just self-defense. Don't worry about it. The Scrabania Temple acts in a very similar manner with multiple trials you have to face, except Scrabs are f***ing nightmare creatures. There are a couple hanging around the stockyards, so you know their ear-piercing howls well already. But this time, all that stands between you and these blood-red, needle-nosed, totally jacked centaur creatures is how fast you can run. And let me give you a quick tip here, they've got two more legs than you, so what I'm saying is, you are not safe. Each temple ends with a chase sequence running from either scrabs or paramites, and the adrenaline these sections caused me as a child, I remember to this very day, and playing them now brings it right back. These games are really intense, I probably should not have been playing them as a six-year-old. Upon finishing each trial, Abe is gifted a hand tattoo of each creature to signify that he's proven himself worthy. Side note though, I've never seen someone in this much pain from getting a tattoo before. Maybe like ease up on the guy, he just went through hell and back. Get him a Dr. Pepper for odds sake. With both tattoos acquired, Abe earns the power of the Shrikel, an ancient Mudokan god that takes the form of a mixture of both scrabs and paramites that can shoot lightning out of its body to kill literally everything, as if scrabs and paramites weren't scary enough already. Using the Shrikel's power, Abe returns to Rupture Farms to shut it down once and for all. And remember how I said it was up to you whether or not to save Mudokans? Well, the repercussions of that are as follows. Save less than 50 of these schmucks, and when push comes to shove, Big Face can't convince his fellow Muds to help Abe out, and it's game over for the Mudokan savior. But of course, that's not the canon ending, because that wouldn't be much of a franchise, now would it? Saving 50 or more Mudokans, the Big Face and friends call upon a storm of mystical lightning to fry Moloch and his attendant, freeing Abe to celebrate with the 99 other Muds who were able to escape from the destruction of Rupture Farms. All's well that ends well. What an incredibly solid game though, like for something that came out way long ago, like it's such a great mixture of stealth and puzzle solving gameplay that just feels incredible to play even to this day. Sure, the checkpoint system might hamper the experience, but use save states and boom, even better game. <laughs> A lot of other people thought so too, considering Abe's Odyssey made it into the PlayStation's Greatest Hits collection, was one of the 20 titles featured on the PlayStation Classic console released in 2018, almost made it into PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale as DLC, but was cancelled because that game was garbage. And Abe even appears in the Binding of Isaac Four Souls card game, which is still releasing right now, so... You know I'm not just chugging nostalgia juice over here when I'm complimenting this game. Abe really became one of the PlayStation's most popular characters, even a mascot of sorts, after one entry in his series, and he was not even close to being done. Remember how I said this game was supposed to be part of a quintology? Well, Oddworld Inhabitants was like, hey, we're still gonna do that quintology thing, okay? But we're also gonna have bonus games. And honestly, that's one of the most beautiful things I've ever heard. And guys, I've heard a lot of beautiful things in my time. Now that Abe's had his Odyssey, he gets to have his Exodus, or, you know, his eggs Odys. Again, the spelling gets me, I keep thinking of that to this very day. The game picks up right where Odyssey left off, with Abe in front of a roaring crowd of Mudokans when disaster strikes. He farts on stage, we've all been there. He's very embarrassed, of course, but Big Face jovially pats him on the back to let him know it's all okay when disaster strikes again. Abe is knocked off the stage and smashes his head into the ground, immediately becoming unconscious and hallucinating the ghosts of his ancestors. We've all been there. So the weirdos, that's what they're called, I'm not just insulting them, tell Abe that miles away in the sacred burial ground of the Mudokans, Necrum, the Gluckans are digging up ancient Mudokan bones using, and get this, uh, Mudokans with sewn up eyes, or as Abe puts it, blind ones that couldn't see. Seeing as that that's not a cool thing for them to do, that was a terrible choice of words, actually, I'm sorry. Abe and his new pals set out for Necrum by walking through the desert because they don't have any cars or Heelys or nothing. This doesn't go swimmingly because it's the desert, but thanks to an overhead train they almost get hit by, they know they're going the right way and manage to break into the mines where Abe, of course, falls down a cliff as he is known to do. Back to the gameplay department. Abe is practically identical to Odyssey with the addition of the very important Alia game speak command which, as it sounds like, allows you to have more than one Budokan follow Abe around. Hallelujah. 
Mudokins can also have emotions now and need to either be apologized to, slapped in the face for being too silly. I would, wow, I, I would be, I would be assaulted so many times if this was a real thing. And these last ones aren't emotions, but blind Mudokins need to be led around using sound so they don't walk into hazards. There are also sick Mudokins who need to be healed, but that comes way later. Mudokins can also perform tasks like pulling levers or activating these turn wheels in this game. So we have the same good gameplay as before, but with a lot more to think about. Abe's range of possessable creatures is also increased, now being able to control paramites and scrabs for some new platforming combat challenges. Fun detail with these, when you release a slig from possession, Abe kills them. With Paramites and Scrabs, they're, they're just chill, he doesn't do anything to those. I'm thinking this is probably because they don't want you to get softlocked in puzzles, but I choose to believe it's Abe being absolutely ruthless, because he even giggles after he lets them explode. <laughs> this man is unhinged. There are also flying slugs now, which are my personal favorites, since you can take them all over the place throwing bombs to clear a path for Abe. There is one more big addition to that pool, but we'll get to that in a little while. Back from Odyssey, there are plenty of secret areas where you'll be finding groups of the now 300 Budokans you're trying to save. Rooms with secrets have these little Soulstorm brew bottles somewhere on screen, and that makes it much easier to find, thus reducing some trial and error deaths. But this is also the first game to include the quick load feature, so experiment to your heart's content. Just from the first level, it's easy to see how big of a difference even some of these small changes make, like Abe's Odyssey is a deeply satisfying adventure to master, and Exodus feels like a reward for making it through, where Abe has improved himself and his powers. Even with a more competent Abe, though, he's unable to stop his friends from indulging in some Soulstorm brew after a long walk through unfavorable conditions. As they partake in the gross green gunk and become sick from it, Abe makes the shocking realization that the guys that were willing to turn them into weird novelty popsicles are making brew out of their bones. There's not a single chance that the FDA would be okay with that because those bones must be hella dirty at this point. Abe has to abandon his friends for now since he can't cure them of their sickness, but he does manage to destroy a part of the mining facility on his way out. To gain the power he needs, the weirdos tell Abe he's gotta obtain another sick tattoo, and to get that ink, he's gotta take on two temples based on scrabs and paramites. Hey, wait a minute, that's some deja vu, ain't it? But this isn't as much of an issue as before because we now have the added potential for puzzles involving possession of those creatures which is totally fine by me. You might have noticed I haven't given a spoiler warning yet, and that's because- Wait. With Abe's powers enhanced again, he returns to Necker Mines to help his friends out. Abe's not back for long though, because his friends allow him access to this area called Fico Depot, a new hub area that offshoots to Slig Barracks, Boneworks, and finally, Soulstorm Brewery. We can't get there without permission from all three of the head Gluckens though, so hey, remember how I said you can possess more things in this game? Gluckens are on that list. They can't do much though, they just sort of waddle around and bark orders at Sligs to do things for them, but the most important thing is Abe gets all three of these guys to open the way to Soulstorm Brewery, and then they explode and die. Quick interjection I forgot to mention, once you get to Fico Depot, Abe starts drinking Soulstorm Brew and it makes his farts explode, uh, and he can also possess them and fly them around like drones and uh, cause them to explode on command uh, elsewhere. So he is a big hypocrite for uh, trying to get everyone else to stop drinking it. Also, it's made of your bones. That's, wait a minute, I thought they were 100% meat. Okay, maybe I was wrong, but the chart from the original game from Odyssey looked like they were like 100% meat, right? While traversing the brewery later, Abe discovers the second ingredient in Soulstorm Brew is Mudokin Tears. And the brewmaster gets these tears by hanging Mudokins by their feet and electrocuting them until they cry into a giant vat of tears below them. And then when you drink it, you get sick because it's probably some like mad cow disease cannibalism shenanigans. Uh, so let's burn this place to the ground because they definitely deserve it. Abe breaches the boiler room and sets it to blow, but if you haven't rescued enough Mudokins, uh, uh, the angry Mudokins clock you over the head and leave you for dead. And then Abe actually gets strapped into the tear extractor thing and is killed or I don't know if he died or, or he's respawning somewhere else. He's doing the respawning bird thing, so eh. But of course, if you do the right thing and save as many Mudokins as possible, Abe is successful in destroying the brewery and then is able to finally accept his role as savior of the Mudokins going forward. If you ask me whether Abe's Odyssey or Exodus was better, it's a really hard choice because they both have their merits and it's really easy to compare them based on moveset and length, but I don't really think they should be compared like that because they fit together so well as a pair. This is basically like a part one and part two of an adventure except for the fact that it is a main adventure and then it's companion piece. So the best way to play these things is definitely back to back, don't worry about which one's better. Though if you're craving something a little bit more simple, 
they put Oddworld on the Game Boy. This was always kind of crazy to me because I always saw Oddworld as this really gritty and intense adventure, and the Game Boy was always just so, like, grainy and not intense. Like, I was less surprised to see Austin Powers on the Game Boy than Oddworld. Oh, behave. But here we are, it's the same plot as Oddworld Abe's Odyssey, except it begins at the point where Abe meets Big Face and is sent to explore his two temples. From here, you get introduced to a surprising amount of mechanics making the transition over from the PlayStation version. Like, Possession functioning the exact same way, and Sligs even have access to their guns. I don't know, I was expecting a very simple platformer, but Oddworld Adventures is a faithful recreation of the second act of Odyssey, and you can even see the same room layouts, more or less, in certain areas. It does end before Abe returns to Rupture Farms, but it has the same ending, but uh, there's just no saving Mudokins, so there's no bad ending or anything like that. I guess it was a little bit too advanced for the Game Boy. Fortunately though, Oddworld Adventures 2 has all of that and more. Since we're on the Game Boy Color now and it's much more beefy and intimidating, we even have the Game Speak function back, which allows us to talk to Mudokins and lead them to their freedom, just like in the console games, woo! You can also possess Paramites and Scrabs, just like in Exodus, but you know, I do have one Huge complaint about this, uh, since we've introduced color to the world, things look really busy and it's hard to tell what you can walk through and, you know, what's a wall. In the first game, the negative space of each stage really helped define the world despite how simple it looked, but Oddworld Adventures 2 ends up looking like a really messy painting complete with a man wearing a blue morph suit. Look at him just prancing around. Freak it, it freaks me out a little bit. I, I think he's heading to, like, blue man group tryouts, but he's a little too early. <clears throat> I need to check that. Oh, shit. Like, I think he's heading to the Blue Man Group tryouts or something, but he's like eight years too late. There we go, I fixed it. But how can I really complain about anything in this game when they even included Abe's disgusting exploding stench clouds? Like, and they must be super powerful in this universe because the Game Boy Color Gluckins seem to have gigantic clown noses. I hate talking about farts, dude. I don't want to talk about them anymore. These games were a lot more impressive than I was expecting, but what do you say we get back into the main Quintology now? The next one's a pretty big deal, as it is the first ever 3D Oddworld title, Oddworld Munch's Odyssey, and now at this point, Odyssey is spelled O-D-D-Y-S-E-E, -E. Mario is just incorrect. I'm sure that at this point you can tell that Ambition must be Lorne Lanning's middle name, and with what came before Munch's Odyssey, most would be inclined to believe it. Well, what if I told you that Munch's Odyssey was set to be an evolution of the Oddworld gameplay of mind-blowing proportions, even by today's standards? But it turns out, production of the game would be a lot more rocky than anyone anticipated, thanks to the dawn of a new console that would go on to make waves, all the while letting Oddworld get sucked into the undertow. I'm gonna stop being ominous now, though, and we're gonna talk about the game that actually got released. And if the intro sounded like there was a little bit too much doom and gloom, I apologize, because I do really like this entry to the series. There are just some areas where there are some unavoidable issues that spring up. Munch's Odyssey released for the original Xbox in 2001 and starred everyone's favorite Mudokin Abe back again to kick some Gluckin butt. But this time, he wouldn't be on the job alone. Introducing Munch. He's a creature called a Gabbit, a race of amphibious fellows that much like the Mudokins are being harvested for nefarious reasons. Like real-world fish, their eggs are in high demand and are hailed as a delicacy. Gluckins also really enjoy ripping their lungs out to save themselves as their organs are somehow compatible. Just a thought, maybe the Gluckins should just stop smoking all the time, and then they wouldn't need so many lung transplants. Like, every time you see a Gluckin in this series, they've got a cigar. Were they born with- is that like a- not a cigar and it's like a, an appendage? Stop it! Stop it! The Gabbits have been hunted to such an extreme that at the beginning of the game, Munch is searching the entire ocean looking for another of his kind, and he can't find a single soul. Until he hears a cry coming from the land. So Munch hops out of the water, and he's looking around for whoever might be returning his call, and BAM! He's caught in a bear trap. <laughs> we then see a mysterious aircraft coming down from the heavens to abduct Munch, and that's when we realize that all of this information is being told to Abe and a few of his friends by this very strange looking gigantic tree creature. This new character is the Almighty Raisin. He is an ancient being that is a living tree that apparently is like 14,000 years old, so he's got like a lot of knowledge, but he has a lot of trouble staying awake at this point, because let's be honest, like I'm 26 and I have trouble staying awake throughout the whole day. 14,000 years old? <laughs> Bro, I'm in dreamland all the time. <laughs> Abe is tasked with rescuing Munch from Viker's labs, and in turn, Munch will supposedly be the key to helping Abe save the Mudokin labor eggs being held captive in the floating fortress. Unknown to Abe and the gang, Munch has been modified by a Viker, giving him the power of Sonar, which originally had the intention of having him collect captured creatures for them, 
But that's not what happens, because these modifications actually allow Munch to interface with Viker technology, and he ends up freeing the captured Fuzzles nearby. Fuzzles might look cute, but you really don't want to get on their bad side. With the help of the Fuzzles, Munch breaks out of his restraints, and Abe heads towards Viker's lab. Starting with Abe, he retains his game speak, running, and sneaking abilities from the past two titles, and much like the huge jump in power between the PS1 and Xbox, Abe's jump has been buffed. No more jumping straight up or forward a couple spaces, Abe is leaping all over the place with the greatest of ease. I always sort of considered Mudokins to be sort of frog-esque, and when I was a kid, Abe's mad ups here had me convinced that there was more to that conspiracy theory than I thought. But I was a dumb kid, because obviously Munch is much more froggish. Abe's possession ability returns and functions a bit differently now. All over the levels, you find these green lumps growing out of the ground. I'd normally advise against touching something like that, but you're gonna have to trust me on this. These are called spoose shrubs, and they're really important. They act as a currency of sorts to activate devices all over Oddworld, and by sacrificing spoose, Abe can charge up a possession orb, which will last longer depending on how much spoose is used. The orb can then roam the landscape and capture any industrial creature that might be lurking nearby, or it can just act as a really nice reconnaissance mechanic. Obviously, the power had to change from Exodus to here, since an enemy can't run off screen to avoid being possessed like before, so it had to be limited somehow. Though enemies don't react to the possession orb at all now, so it ends up feeling a lot more overpowered as a result. You're not gonna see me complaining because it does make some of the issues in this game a little bit more easy to deal with. Our other main character, Munch, at first seems rather lackluster, seeing how slowly he moves on land, but that's because his area of expertise is the water. Abe cannot swim and will take damage the longer he sits in the water drowning. Munch, however, is even more agile than Abe is on land, able to leap from the water in a manner that would put dolphins to shame. Or he would if dolphins existed in this universe. Maybe that's why Oddworld's such a dystopian world, there's just the lack of dolphins. On land, Munch can use his sonar to free fuzzles from captivity, and in turn they'll fight for him since he doesn't have an attack of his own, unless he makes use of one of the game's new power-ups. Munch specifically is drawn to the Zap Vendo, which allows him to use his new brain implant to electrocute enemies to aid his fuzzle companions. There are a lot of these vending machines all around that offer different effects, such as the most common high jump and speed up drinks. And in the original Xbox version, you'd also find these Sobe machines that would heal your characters, and I'm not sure how to feel about Sobe being canon to the Oddworld universe, but the machines got retextured in later releases since the product placement deal was a one-time thing, I assume. Munch's sonar also gives them the ability to control certain electronics, such as the Snoozer. This is a large robotic spider-looking creature that has both a turret gun and a zap attack. And instead of killing anyone it comes across, it just puts them to sleep, as the name would imply. But, you know, they might as well be dead, because they're down for the count once you take them out, and... I don't know if it's part of some kind of morality thing we're trying to push here, but I would much rather just have them killed. I know that sounds bad, but, like, they cut this man's head open and put a computer chip in. Like, they're basically, like, a million little Elon Musks running around. We can't have that. There are plenty more uses for this power, but I'm gonna let you figure those things out on your own when you play the game for yourself. Because, uh, oh yeah, I forgot to mention that all of the games I've talked about so far are up on Steam as part of a bundle called The Odd Box, and it's only $13. You get Abe's Odyssey, Abe's Exodus, Munch's Odyssey, and the game we're talking about next, and this thing goes on sale all the time, and take my word for it, this is a worthwhile purchase. I think Abe's Odyssey and Exodus might have some issues running on, like, Windows 10 and 11, but I believe you can find tutorials on YouTube to fix that, so it shouldn't be too much of a problem. Once the two heroes meet up, the game becomes about using Abe and Munch's powers together to make it through each level to rescue as many of their trapped friends as possible. Since, of course, just like the last two games, you're gonna want to shoot for the good ending as opposed to the bad one. I find, though, that the game tends to lean more on the easier side this time, and I'm pretty sure that's because of the jump to 3D. When Abe was sneaking through the shadows to avoid Sligs in 2D, it was really tense because there wasn't a way past without directly engaging them. In Munch, it's really easy to run circles around most enemies, and then tie that together with a bunch of jumps, and unless the Sligs have, like, powerful guns, they can't really touch you. Munch is also typically safe in the water aside from landmines, and if any Sligs are positioned close to water, a couple zaps make short work of them because they just drown. Their pants are made of metal, so they just under the sea, like, no more. The other thing that makes this game a lot easier is the addition of a health bar. Instead of one-hit deaths, which I'll admit would have been brutal in a game like this, Abe and Munch are able to take a lot of punishment before dying and needing to be revived. As long as one character is alive, you won't need to reload your save, and the quick save feature returns again, solidifying the easy nature of this one. That means the way that some areas are made more difficult is just by adding more enemies or hazards, which doesn't really make it harder, it just makes it a little bit more tedious to clear the rooms out. Unfortunately, though, among its player base, Munch's Odyssey is known to be a little bit rough around the edges, and in the decades I've been playing this game, I can agree with that. This game is... over 20 years old. <sighs> 
Anyway, the HD version that's up on Steam and modern consoles has its own jank to it as well. I've noticed a lot of sound balancing issues where sometimes I can't hear the characters talking at all and sometimes the music is hardly there and some sound effects are much louder than others. Some of the new textures also look a little stanky compared to the original definition versions. And this next thing isn't a glitch, but you're able to change Abe and Munch's walk speed in the new HD port. And I'm not sure why this was an option because it practically makes Abe and Munch untouchable. You know, when Munch's whole gimmick was that he was supposed to be slow on land. Like the dude is faster on land than he is in water if you crank his run speed all the way up to 10. And I don't really understand the appeal for that. It's really strange to me that a game that existed on older hardware that had its own issues was ported to newer consoles and now has new issues. I mean, come on, that never happens. Though there is a really good reason for the original game being a little buggy like it is, and I will talk about that after we do the story, so I think it's time for another... Wait. This game doesn't have a ton of story in it. You'll go several levels without any plot happening, typically. But what you need to know is ever since Munch escaped, the Gluckens are in a panic trying to find him because their queen has fallen ill, and they need Munch's lungs to save her. This conflicts with Munch's desires, as he would like to keep breathing. Abe needs to get to Viker's labs, and initially Munch is not willing to help him until the Raisin tells him that the Gluckens are auctioning off the last can of Gabiar, which happens to contain hundreds of Gabbit eggs, giving Munch the hope to revive his species. Now that Abe and Munch's goals align, the Raisin cooks up a plan to get the boys where they need to be. See, there's this Glucken named Lulu, who is famously very lazy and a total failure as far as Gluckens go, so Abe and Munch have to ensure that other Gluckens donate as much money as possible to the Lulu Fund, thus allowing Abe and Munch to sneak aboard Lulu's hypothetical airship to begin their raid on Viker's labs. This plan goes really well, and they do just that, but if your Quormo is rotten because he left a bunch of Budokens and Fuzzles to die, this is where Abe and Munch meet a very unfortunate end. The fuzzles shred them to pieces, and the Vikers hang up Abe's head on the wall like they're running a Bass Pro Shop, and then they tear Munch's lungs out. Good one, guys. <laughs> you got us. This used to be the most, like, horrifying ending in the series, despite how it's played for laughs, but then Oddworld Soulstorm came along several years later and was like, <laughs> hold my brew. If you've got good quorum at this point, you get access to the last few levels, which are the hardest part of the game, since to rescue labor eggs, Abe and Munch need to safely drop them into exit portals. But they are super fragile. Make one wrong move and Abe's unborn brothers are scrambled. And not in a delicious breakfast kind of way. After saving the eggs, Abe and Munch crash the Gabiar auction and Abe compels Lulu to bid higher and higher to win. Only just being able to maintain control long enough to bid Lulu's entire fortune in exchange for the Gabiar, which somehow finds its way into Munch's hands. They don't really explain that part. I assume they just kill Lulu or something after that, which is kind of sad, but you know, them's the bricks. Abe and Munch flee Viker's labs and watches the Fuzzles parting gift sends it up in flames. It crashes to the ground, and behind the floating fortress lies another moon, this time with Munch's footprint on it. If we get a new moon for every hero in the Quintology, that is five moons, and that is four more than there should be. I don't know how people didn't notice this beforehand. We are being invaded. But now that we've covered the meat and eggs of this one, let's talk about Munch's Odyssey and Xbox. You might think it's weird that the Oddworld series that was primarily featured on PlayStation suddenly jumped to being an Xbox exclusive. Well, there was a PS2 version in the works, but according to this interview with Lauren Lanning I read about on Survivor, apparently Microsoft was considering giving out the original Xbox for free to ensure it would capture the casual gaming market. And of course, a free console means a massive increase in players looking to buy games. And Oddworld wanted a piece of that. This caused Oddworld inhabitants to abandon the PS2 port and work instead on the Xbox port, delaying the game that might have even released alongside the PS2 a year before it would eventually release on Xbox. So there was a lot of work done in that version, I feel like. Since reading excerpts from this GamePro magazine, there were tons of additional features and mechanics that never saw the light of day. Probably because they had to ditch what they had and redo a bunch of stuff to work on the Xbox, resulting in a more watered-down version of the game that contained a lot more issues. And with the Xbox turning out to not actually be free, this meant Oddworld fans that were still with PlayStation wouldn't receive a new game to play, and blooming Xbox fans wouldn't have any way to experience what came before Munch therefore leading to much less interest and poorer sales. That, sir, is a massive yikes, and I feel very bad that that happened the way it did. And when you look at some stuff that we almost had with this theoretical PS2 version, this game seems like it would have been an entirely different beast. According to this magazine, you could actually switch between Abe, Munch, and Lulu, who might have had more involvement in the plot aside from just being possessed into spending his money. To earn moolah, there were mechanics in place where Abe would travel around to factories to improve conditions of the workers, make sure that they were healthy and all that stuff, and that would lead to more productivity and the furthering of the ultimate goal. The world was also said to be much more alive, with new AI systems in place to alter things based on your quorma, and reading all this makes me really sad 
because it sounds super different and hugely ambitious compared to what we got. There's one more small thing I learned about Munch's Odyssey as well after I finished editing and recording everything. Apparently at some point Munch was also supposed to get this transformation that would turn him into this really swole version of himself. And that whole deal came about because of all the Viker experiments, so I don't know if he would have still had the sonar and the zap powers, but this seemed like a pretty cool idea, kinda sad this didn't make it any either. I really wish things ended up different for this game because I would have liked to see what this game would have been like if it was fully realized, but I still have a very large nostalgic attachment to what we got. So I'm still gonna say it, Munch's Odyssey is still a game that is worth playing and it is an enjoyable time. Believe it or not, this would not be the only time that a company would make things a little bit difficult for Oddworld inhabitants. Uh, but before we get to any more of that, we need to talk about Wieners Co. No, they are not the sponsor of this video. I don't think I would want to sponsor whatever they were doing. This is actually the only note I have written down in my notes section about the Oddworld Munch's Odyssey GBA port. This would be the last time we'd get an alternate version of a mainline Oddworld game on a Nintendo system, and what a game to go out on. The closest thing I can compare Munch's Odyssey GBA to would be Banjo-Kazooie Grunty's Revenge. A pseudo 3D game using, not sure if you would call this an isometric viewpoint or not, but it adapts the gameplay of its inspiration into this other style. We have a 3D Oddworld adventure starring Abe and Munch doing Abe and Munch things against these really gnarly pixel art recreations of Munch's Odyssey levels. The visuals are of course a massive step up from Oddworld Adventures 2, but it does look and play a little iffy at times. Apparently this Wieners Co. place is a big part of the story. I'm so happy they went with that name. That is peak Oddworld to me. Uh, the game doesn't have a save system though, so instead it just uses passwords that lets you jump to each level where you left off, and I'm not sure how well that works with trying to keep your Quarma up. Probably best to just play it in one sitting, so it's a good thing it's only 13 levels long. This is a really fateful demake of the original version, and if you've liked everything you've seen so far, you might as well give this one a shot too, because like, I mean, what do you got to lose, right? It's Munch's Odyssey, but he's only got 32 bits to his name. Throw him a bone, throw him a bit. Actually, don't throw Abe any bones. I think he's probably had enough of bones. Going off the established pattern so far, you might expect Munch's Exodus to be next, and you would be right if Munch's Exodus wasn't one of the many canceled Oddworld games from over the years. According to the Oddworld fan wiki, Munch's Exodus would have been a direct continuation seeing Munch travel to a known Gabbit spawning location to hatch and raise the Gabbit eggs from Munch's Odyssey. But that's pretty much it. No concrete details on gameplay or playable characters. I, I just would have really liked to see what happened to Munch post-Odyssey, but it was never meant to be after the issues that plagued the first game. More on cancelled games in a little while, but for now we're going to talk about more games that actually exist. The next Oddworld game in line is another game that is not part of the Quintology, but exists in the same Oddworld we know and love. We have Oddworld Stranger's Wrath. Up until this point, all the stories we've partaken in have taken place in Eastern Mudos, whereas Stranger's Wrath now takes place on Western Mudos. I think it was a great idea to flesh out this continent and just further the odd world, you know, because we've only seen what Eastern Mudos looks like, and now we know that Western Mudos is somewhere that Clint Eastwood would really like. Assuming he actually liked cowboy stuff and wasn't just typecast, I really don't know. Is he even alive? I don't even know if he's alive. I'm not gonna look it up. I was gonna say I don't care, but that's really rude. I do care. I just don't care. That being said, there are a lot less friendly faces in this one. You'll only recognize the Vikers from the previous games. Everyone else is a completely new species and all new characters. Our main character, likewise, is neither a Mudokan or Gabbit. He's simply Stranger, as far as we're told. This dude is a badass bounty hunter directly out of a gritty Western film, and his persona is absolutely nailed by the amazing voice performance from series creator Lauren Lanning. This is actually a good time to mention, but Lauren Lanning actually also voices Abe. And what I didn't know is that he also voices Munch and the Sligs, and the Gluckens, and the Vikers, and the Grubs, and the Clackers, and everyone in Soulstorm. Like, the talent on this man, my god! There are very few characters in this franchise that Lauren does not voice, and I think that's really impressive considering you can't even tell most of them are just him doing different voices. In previous Oddworld games, you were very much on the defensive side of things, as most enemies could eliminate Abe and Munch in a matter of seconds. In Stranger's Wrath, your role has been reversed, as Stranger's main goal in this game is to hunt down dangerous criminals to earn moolah. He does this by using his crossbow, not loaded with bolts or bullets, but instead loaded with a variety of small creatures that all function differently. Stranger's main weapon is the Zap Fly. He carries an infinite amount of them, as they can be used as both low damage rapid fire weapons and to operate machinery and other gizmos. Every other type of ammo must be hunted down in the field while running around Western Mudos, those being chip punks, which lure enemies to the location to set up ambushes or traps, puzzles, which latch onto foes and cause them to panic and take damage, stunks, a skunk that causes enemies to vomit and become stunned, bolomites, a spider that wraps the target in webbing, thud slugs, which deal big damage, stingbees, which are a rapid fire alternative to zap flies that do more damage, 
and the Bomb Bat, which explodes upon hitting its target. Stranger can also perform some melee moves for crowd control, but most of the time his crossbow is the preferred method of combat. Once an enemy has taken enough damage, they'll become stunned, indicated by the yellow stars above their heads. Stranger can either keep attacking them until they die, or pull out his Danny Phantom Thermos to capture the outlaw to make extra moolah. Enemies and bosses are worth more alive than dead, but there's only one ending in the game, meaning you're free to kill as many baddies as you want. Capturing them alive is much more of a personal challenge than anything else, but that's the gist of the gameplay. Stranger takes on bounties in town, then heads out on foot to track down the outlaw in the game's very nice interconnected world. It's not totally open and fairly linear most of the time, but it works really well with how Stranger plays. This system works really well, and whereas you could see the cracks in Munch's Odyssey all over the place, Stranger's Wrath is an incredibly well put together game. And Lorne himself would later go on to say that he considered it to be the best they ever made at the time. I still prefer the gameplay of the 2D Odd World games over Stranger, but while I was recording gameplay for this series, Funny enough, I ended up spending most of my time playing Stranger's Wrath, and I've even started a separate file for myself to play on in my own time, because the last time I played it was way back on the original Xbox, so I guess it's been a hot minute. The story is also much more present in the game compared to Munch. Stranger starts out the game hunting down a villain called Blister's Booty, and upon arriving in town, we learn through a conversation with the town's doctor that Stranger is building up his stockpile of moolah to pay for surgery. I need this... to survive. Wow! I had no idea that Stranger's Wrath took place in the United States of America. Wait. With the stakes set, we help Stranger round up more criminals traveling from town to town until another opportunity presents itself. The tycoon in charge of the huge dam in the Mongo River, Sekto, offers Stranger all the money he needs for his procedure if he's able to locate a Steef head for it. A Steef is another creature in Oddworld that has been hunted to an extreme degree, partially by Sekto himself, who has dozens of their heads on display. Stranger alludes that he knows where to find one, and Sekto sends another outlaw to interrogate Stranger into revealing the information. During the interrogation, Stranger's surgical bill and information falls from his person, leading to this Line, Get them pants off! Which out of context will never not make me laugh. The outlaws rip Stranger's boots and pants off, revealing that he was a Steef all along and trying to get his back legs removed so he could live a normal life. As now that people know what he is, their perception of him goes from that of a bounty hunter to a wild animal that they have every right to kill despite the fact that he's completely sentient. Yeah, it's super fucked up and Stranger looks like he might not make it out of this one alive, but thanks to some unseen help, He's cut free and fights his way out of the burning hideout and escapes the town, leaving behind even the clackers who now just see him as a dangerous wild animal. Meeting up with the tribe of grubs that saved him, his crossbow is returned and he's given the armor of his Steve ancestors. Apparently there used to be a Steve living amongst the grubs, but that Steve vanished, thus allowing Secto to step in and destroy the grubs' way of life. And just like that, we're back in the familiar position of natives versus industrialists, Stranger seeking to eliminate Secto for both his safety and to aid the struggling grubs. Fighting his way to the top of Secto's dam, Stranger has to take out some strong foes which Secto calls the Glocktigi. These are a combination of Secto's species, the parasitic Octigi, and the Gluckens. No doubt the result of some sick experiments done by Vikers or something, and also really frustrating to fight when there are two using their spin attack at the same time, because you kinda just get stunlocked and killed. I only ever got out of this by spamming boom bats, and that feels super cheap to me. But you know, I guess you fight cheapness with cheapness. Glocktigi be gone, the final fight is against Secto piloting a machine, playing even more into the idea of him being a parasite, never facing Stranger head on. This fight is a little bit of a grind as well, but it is very satisfying when you destroy his machine and he's left with nothing to combat Stranger's Wrath. Stranger throws Secto over his own dam, then it blows up releasing all the water back into the Mongo River Valley, allowing the grubs to continue living that's, they continue living. Later, back on the ground, Stranger and the Grubs come across the body of Secto, who is not looking very good after falling probably thousands of feet off the dam. In a bewildering twist, again though, it's revealed that Secto was actually possessing the body of the old Steef that was protecting the Grubs before Stranger arrived. And having been possessed for all this time, he is incredibly weak and slowly passing away, but with his dying breath, he asks Stranger if the water is free, and Stranger replies that it is allowing the old Steve to pass away knowing that the nightmare is finally over. Nearby in the river, however, we see Secto the Parasite is still alive somehow, and he swims away, clearly plotting some kind of wrath of his own for a later day. Despite the fact that Oddworld Stranger's Wrath was a huge jump in quality from Munch, it sold very poorly, mostly due to Oddworld inhabitants dealing with EA games. EA was the game's publisher, and therefore were supposed to be advertising the game and all that comes with that, but the advertising budget was dropped to next to nothing at some point, which effectively killed the game before it even released. 
Despite this though, Stranger and its re-releases are generally looked favorably upon by players and reviewers alike, which makes it all the more a shame that EA ruined the initial launch. And with two games launching to less than favorable sales, this would unfortunately cause Oddworld inhabitants to cancel a whole boatload of projects and eventually close their doors, making the world a much darker place in the process. Briefly, I'd like to mention some of the cancelled titles that I just referred to, because there were some important ones, such as the third game in the Quintology, which would have been called Squeak's Odyssey. We have, like, one piece of concept art for this and have no idea what the game would have been about, aside from that it would have been about Squeak and his Odyssey. We don't actually even know if this is Squeak, we just have to assume. But there's really not much known, and it's a shame that, like, we had a third game planned and it's now dead forever. We also had a game called Oddworld Sligstorm, which doesn't even have a single piece of concept art or anything. We just know that it would have starred an albino slig who had to escape from the slig barracks because he's an albino slig and the other sligs didn't like that. But my thing about this one is like, sligs are such pathetic creatures without their augmentation. So it's like, I wonder how much the game would have played into that. Like, I wonder if there would have been alternatives to the regular pants and flying pants. I wonder if you know, maybe eventually this slig would have gone to be with the natives and, like, become a hero. Like, I'm always really interested in anti-heroes or characters going from, like, evil to, to good. Like, I think it would have been a really interesting adventure. We also have this game called Hand of Odd, which I don't know if there are very many things about, but I believe it was supposed to be an RTS game where you could either control the natives, which is, like, you know, Mudokins and Gabbits and all them, versus the industrialists. And you would go around building up your populations and, uh, probably partaking in battles with the opposite side, if I had to guess. And we're gonna finish things up with, uh, The Brutal Ballad of Fangus Clot, which is a game I, again, don't know very much about aside from what's on the wiki, but it had a lot of information going for it. I would actually recommend you go read the wiki article for it. It seemed like it was gonna be very different compared to the other games, and something on the wiki was saying it might have been some kind of idea for a sequel to Stranger's Wrath, but obviously since Stranger didn't do very well, that was shelved along with everything else. I'm gonna link the Oddworld wiki down in the description actually so you could check out some of this stuff because it is a really interesting read. But the point is, all of these things got cancelled and Oddworld inhabitants and Oddworld as a whole faded into obscurity which really broke my heart. Now that I think about it, I think this is the first time that a series I really loved stopped being produced. And, you know, I was young at the time so that was new to me and... Uh, it's a bummer, dude. What felt like an eternity would go by before any news about Oddworld would ever grace our screens again. But eventually, thanks to a company out there called Just Add Water, we learned of an Oddworld Abe's Odyssey remake to hit stores in 2015. I'm not embarrassed to tell you guys this, but when I saw the announcement for Oddworld New and Tasty in a Game Informer magazine, I actually ripped the page out and I tacked it to my wall so every day I woke up I could see that Oddworld was coming back and it just kind of like filled my heart with so much emotion that I probably cried every day. All right, I'm exaggerating, but maybe like every other day. Oddworld New and Tasty is a remake slash reimagining in the sense that it's very recognizable as the first game in the series, but with a fresh coat of paint and the most obvious change being seamless exploration of levels as opposed to hitting the edge of the screen and loading the next chunk. To go along with this change, Abe now has a health meter since one hit kills can feel a little cheaper now that you can't just run off screen to mess with Slig AI. For Oddworld purists though, a one hit kills mode is still included in the difficulty select. Without the ability to reset puzzles or enemies by walking off screen, enemies like Sligs will now fall asleep after a certain amount of time if they don't hear any noise, allowing you to sneak by them again at the expense of waiting for them to do so. This also applies to bird portals since you're back to rescuing Mudokans, and there are 300 of them now instead of 99, and this is accomplished by changing up the secret areas to include more to save, and in some cases adding new areas within them. Since leading 300 Mudokans one by one would have been a nightmare, the Alia command has been included, and Mudokan AI is also a slight bit better, but they are still unable to jump, climb, or do much of anything on their own, which works perfectly fine with how the game is meant to be played, of course. Possession works mostly the same way as well, and I believe it's even easier to pull off now since Sligs can't run off screen to avoid it. The only thing I'm not a huge fan of here is how they translated to Abe's movement. The original feels a lot like you were snapping to areas on a grid, which helped keep the entire adventure very simple and satisfying to understand, as you know your hop takes you forward three spaces and that never changes. In New and Tasty, the entire game feels very, like, Unity-y? I, I don't know if that makes sense to me. Like, you know how y you might play a game and you go, oh, this was made in Unity Engine, wasn't it? Because it, like, feels very, like, default Unity Engine-y, and it probably has, like, a ragdoll death animation. That's Unity. New and Tasty is perfectly playable, but if you rely on muscle memory, you will die a million times since Abe's moves now have this odd, sluggish feel to them. Maybe it's because of the more fluid animations taking a little bit longer for the moves to come out. I feel like I'm talking about Smash Bros. all of a sudden. But things like his running jump need to be pressed earlier than in the original, along with his roll and most other things. 
As I played more levels, I was able to get used to it, but without that grid-based movement I mentioned, no matter how used to things I got, I found myself rolling farther than I intended, or jumping into a mine, or walking out of a shadow too soon. This is a problem exclusive to players of the original game, of course, so you, the viewer, someone who's most likely never enjoyed this franchise before, will have little to no issues, I think. The game comes with a quick save and quick load function as well, so no matter how many deaths or mess-ups I had, they were negated pretty quickly. It's just I found the need for the save state feature a lot higher with the remake than the original. And that's saying something, because the original had those really sparse checkpoints. I've already talked about the story of this one, and there aren't any major changes aside from the increase in docking count, so I'll end this segment by saying I'm glad they were able to bring Oddworld back and give it a future, and it's very worth playing, and it exists on a majority of consoles and Steam. Like, literally, I think this actually is on the Wii U, and to me, for some reason, that is the weirdest thing I've ever seen. It's like seeing Oddworld on the Game Boy again. Like, I don't... Like, the Wii U? Really? Like, play it on the Switch. Please, it's on Switch. Get it on Switch, get it on Steam. It's there. I believe there's also a, a three-pack of games for the Switch that includes New and Tasty, Stranger's Wrath HD, and Munch HD. So you might just go with that. Like, that'd be a pretty good one to get. I don't know how much money it is, though. Probably 30 bucks. Am I right, Andrew? And with that, we have finally arrived at the most recent Oddworld game in the series, Oddworld Soulstorm. And you guys better strap in because we are in for a major tone shift. We go from having a dedicated fart button to a biblical journey to save a devastated species packed with existential dread. But you can still do this to Abe's eyes on the main menu. Now that existential dread thing is actually really relevant because we meet up with Abe after the events of New and Tasty where he is now responsible with keeping 300 people in addition to himself alive. And coming from someone who has a hard time keeping one person alive, I think Abe is honestly rocking it. You might think that this is a remake of Abe's Exit is, just like New and Tasty was for Odyssey, but this is much more of a reimagining as opposed to a remake. Seeing as Lauren had big plans for Abe's Exit is, but the PS1 wouldn't be enough to handle any of that stuff, these big plans are now put into action in this fully new game that has similar elements. And you know, those big plans sure did reflect the game's development time, because Soulstorm was announced in 2015 and didn't release until 2021, and I've definitely got some words on that whole ordeal. But first we're gonna do gameplay since the story is massive this time around. Gameplay has seen a huge revamp and feels like both an evolution of Oddworld and a step away from what it used to be, and I think that might have been a turnoff for some longtime fans. But I was honestly amped to check this thing out after such a long wait. Gone is the clunky Unity feel of new and tasty because we had to make room for Abe, God of Aerial Maneuvers! Abe now has a double jump and overall feels a lot more like as much as Odyssey incarnation than anything else. He can still hoist up ledges, throw levers and switches, sneak, run, and has a health bar, but new to Soulstorm is the crafting system, because every game has to have one of those these days. It's not a bad thing by any means, and looking through lockers and containers and other bins to find things to MacGyver tools together to either defeat or incapacitate enemies is actually a pretty fun time. This being an Oddworld game, of course, you need to start thinking about your Quarma, which means you gotta save Mudokans and stuff, but funny thing about this one is on the pause screen, you can see how many Sligs you've killed in the level. At first, my brain was like, oh man, are we gonna have to take into account, like, how much killing our enemies will affect our Quarma this time around? But later I would find out that no, that's just there to make you feel bad, I guess? I, but it, like, it has no bearing on anything, so after that, I did not have any more remorse. Speaking of which, Possession returns, and it's sort of a fusion of the Munch's Odyssey and Abe's Odyssey power, since Abe creates a ball of energy that can fly around the screen, but it can only go so far. Limiting it not by spoose this time, just by the distance. Sligs carry a variety of weapons this time, guns, clubs, and my favorite, the flamethrowers. I really like the flamethrowers, guys. Abe can even make a flamethrower in some levels. <laughs> oh boy. And despite my excited nature at that comment, I'm gonna have to just come out and say it, this game does not feel like Oddworld anymore. To me, Oddworld was stealth, puzzle solving, and occasional power trips when you've earned it. But for the most part, you were this fragile little guy that should be scared all the time because you were basically the bottom of the food chain. And the gameplay made you feel like it. Now, I do feel something when I play Soulstorm. I feel like a psychopath. Not only does this game give you plenty of opportunities to, like, forego stealth and brute force things, but it makes those brute force scenarios so much more fun than simply stealthing by anything that, like, I don't see why I would choose stealth. Even with the stealth mechanics on the initial release of the game being really jank, basically holding down the sneak button would just make it so that nobody could detect you no matter what you were doing. 
I still had more fun burning the world to the ground. This really eliminated the sense of fear from the game because I knew around the corner I'd most likely find materials to make things easier. It was just a matter of sneaking by one guy or possessing him and running him into a saw blade. I'm willing to chalk this change in dynamic up to the progression of the story, like Abe has successfully destroyed Rupture Farms and he's wisened up to how he can deal with these situations and is getting more bold. But the story doesn't give me the vibe that he's changed enough to be confidently wielding a flamethrower. In fact, the story is about him growing into the role of savior, so there's a very clear disconnect between story and gameplay here, and it makes it really, really noticeable. Levels are constructed in a mostly linear manner with secret areas where you can find more materials or Mudokens to save, but this time levels are scored individually instead of counting every rescue together. Each stage usually has a handful of friends to save, but occasionally you'll reach levels with tons of the dudes showing on the HUD down at the bottom, and this is something I grew to despise. These levels are what my friend and I have come to refer to as salmon run stages. What happens is your gang of like 300 plus Mudakins will be running through the stage and get stuck at a point. Then you release them so they can climb up a wall or do something like that. And Sligs will spawn out of random areas and just start like eliminating them by the hundreds, by the tens of hundreds. And what it boils down to is basically a watered down tower defense game where it is incredibly frustrating to try and get these guys to survive to actually get the good ratings for each level. And this isn't just like a, hey, we're gonna do this quick segment and then proceed on with the level. This is like the entire level, pretty much. Like, you'll, you'll let them go up, you'll do one segment of it. Then you'll climb up, and then you have to do it again. And usually there's like three or four sections of this, and my god, it is miserable most of the time. I'm just gonna put this in perspective for you. When I went to play this game again to get footage for this video, I was like, I'm having a great time playing this game. I actually like the change in controls, how Abe is jumping around, flipping and grabbing monkey bars and climbing all over the place. It's very fun. But then I got to the first Salmon Run stage and my heart just kind of like dropped. At that moment, I was like, oh, maybe I don't want to replay this entire game after this. And you know, there are probably like three Salmon Run stages out of the entire 17 stage game. And if three stages can make me reconsider replaying a game in its entirety, I think that's a little bit of an issue. Some might say it's a skill issue, but also, I don't like these stages at all. I'm just gonna, like, literally, I think the game would have been better without these, or if they were, like, completely overhauled into something else that was a little bit more tolerable. Because this game doesn't have the quick save and quick load feature, so if you don't like the outcome of how your salmon run stage is going, you're either gonna have to reset to a checkpoint, which is probably gonna be, like, a good... 10 plus minutes before because like I'm telling these are long stages dude or you're just gonna have to redo the entire stage which gosh oh boy on one hand it's great that the stages are long but on the other hand the stages are long to replay and I'm a bit haunted by that because upon release the game was fairly buggy it had a lot of issues that I ran into with like clipping through things dying randomly getting soft locked in a couple areas there was one point in footage I have, where I got softlocked by doing an incredibly simple thing, which you had plenty of opportunities to do in older Oddworld games. But with the absence of one switch to bring an elevator back down to help me, I had to replay like an entire hour and a half of level because of just like one little mistake that could have easily been fixed. So yeah, I've got some complaints with this one, but I'm happy to tell you that since I played it, there have been updates that have fixed a lot of the issues, and I have seen specifically that a lot of the softlock issues specifically have been fixed. So it should be a smoother adventure if you choose to play it. Overall though, I do really enjoy this game. I think it is a really great time. It's just with the exception of a couple levels and some of my personal experiences that might be different now. But the other thing I love about this game is the story. And I'm happy to say that it is one of Oddworld's best stories they've ever told. Wait. I'm going to make this one quick because it's the newest game and I really recommend you try this one for yourself. This of course takes place directly after New and Tasty and Abe and his Mudokan followers are discovered by Moloch in his airship. Oh yeah, that's a big lore change. Moloch was implied to have survived Rupture Farms in the original Abe's Odyssey, but in this new continuity, he is absolutely real and right there. Funnily enough, no other Gluckens believe that Abe even exists and let alone was able to save 300 workers and destroy Moloch's farm. So basically, all of the other Gluckens assume Moloch did it for the insurance money and he's under investigation. 
So Malik spends the entire game trying to chase Abe down to clear his name, and Abe spends the entire game trying to save all of his people with the help of Alf and Toby. The three of them travel from location to location, trying to find out the secrets behind Soulstorm Brew and their real place in the world. Abe starts to uncover the heinous acts committed by the Gluckens, including and not limited to inventing Soulstorm Brew to drug Mudokens and kill them from withdrawal if they try to escape, creating that drink out of their bones and tears, holding the Mudokan Queen Sam, the mother of every Mudokan hostage, and basically having Mudokans born into labor, and the list goes on and it's really intense. Abe ends up getting his chest tattoo from Exodus and access to the Shrikel power again, but only if your Quarma is good. If you haven't saved enough fellas, I'm gonna preface this by saying it's fucking insane. Abe, Alf, and Toby are unable to fend off the flying slings chasing the train they stole, leading to a fire erupting in the main chamber, and you watch as they scream bloody murder and burn to death through the windows of the train. The fire then spreads to make the train basically a huge fireball going a million miles an hour, and then it just obliterates Soulstorm Brewery and explodes outwards into the distance via the pipelines that pump the brew all over Mudos. This, of course, would lead to brew shortages and also possibly the extinction of the Mudokan race because the Mudokas need to keep drinking the brew or else they get sick and die. So, yeah, that's a pretty bad ending. <laughs> like, holy shit. Moral of the story, go back and play those Salmon Run stages again, you schmuck. If you're not a terrible person, though, Abe is able to invade Necra Mines to stop the mining operation, followed by adding special ingredients to the Soulstorm brew pipelines that cure any Mudokan that drink it. So no more being poisoned today, fellas. Up top. The ending also points the trio of Mudokans towards the possible location of Queen Sam, and that is where our story ends for now. This game is not Abe's Exodus. It is now part of the new Quintology, according to Lauren Lanning. What I respect a lot about this is that they didn't just go, hey, we're going to remake Abe's Exodus. Lauren was like, we are going to make the game that we always wanted to make, but couldn't back then because of money and hardware and time and blah blah and all that stuff. So that's amazing. I'm really glad the vision was like seen through after all these years. And the story is honestly fantastic. Like I said, it's my favorite that they've ever told, but it also gets me thinking about the fact that the cutscenes in this game are so numerous and so gorgeous to look at that I'm wondering if maybe they spent a whole lot of time and money on that stuff, made like a veritable, you know, film out of this pretty much. And then they had less time to work on the gameplay and maybe that led to some of the bugs and stuff upon launch. Because this game did release on PS5 day one as part of like the free PS Plus thing. So I don't know if maybe like it was like rushing towards the end and they weren't able to finish some of the bugs. But now it's been patched so I should stop talking about bugs. I'm just saying that's what I played so it was a little you know, inconsistent. If you're looking to play Oddworld Soulstorm, you can play it on PC through the Epic Store. It is coming to Steam eventually. As of this video, it's not out on Steam yet. You can also play it on PS5 and Xbox Series X, Season, I don't, Season X, I don't know what it's called. I keep forgetting. Time will tell if it comes to anything else like the Switch, but I kind of doubt it with how like graphically intensive that game is. But you know, it's fine to play it other places. I would recommend PC. I've only ever played it on PC also, so I can't speak to any like console exclusive issues that they might have, but I'm pretty sure that the modern consoles can handle it because they're pretty beefy. So in conclusion, Oddworld is an incredible series and I really don't know where it goes from here. Like I, I know the original Quintology had plans, but it seems like those plans are not being used at this point. The story seems to be mainly about Abe and his two friends finding the Queen Mudokan, and that's fine. But you know, I would really love to see Munch again and have him do some kind of thing, or I would really love to see Stranger come back and get another chance at his gameplay and either help out Abe or, you know, go through some new stuff that he has to figure out. I, I, I would love to see this new Quintology explore Squeak's Odyssey. I want to see what his deal was, and I would love to see things like Soulstorm or Hand of Odd come out to flesh out the universe more. I just, I love this series so much. Even if I have to wait another six plus years for the next entry to come out, I will be here waiting until it does because I will always follow this series no matter what it does because I am thoroughly invested in what happens to these characters that I've grown to love over the years. So this is the sappy part. I guess to Lauren Lanning and Oddworld Inhabitants, everyone who was able to help get these games out over the last decades, thank you so much for all of the memories that I've formed with my friends and family playing these games. Because honestly, uh, life would be a lot more boring without them, and I think everyone should give them a shot. So if you want to check out any of these games,
please go to the places that I've mentioned throughout this video, Steam, Switch, Xbox, PlayStation, and try these games out. Because let me tell you, you will not regret it. And uh, I guess that's it for me for today, but uh, perhaps if I could be so bold, you should... Follow me. Oof, that was a long one. Uh, and if you made it this far, you're a champion, I gotta say. Thank you so much. And if you did make it all the way here, please let me know down in the comments, because now you're in the secret club, and therefore are incredibly cool. But if you like this video and you haven't already, please make sure you subscribe, click the bell, follow my Twitter, and join the Discord to keep up with more Oddworld and other things that aren't Oddworld, because I do a lot of things. I'd also like to give a huge thank you to my current supporters, who are... Ashburn the Burning Hedgehog, Brady Hilkemeyer, Mimic, Noah Wizbio, Stanley Lee Dauber, Dax, Minty, Ty Little Tech Guy, Jeremy, Crystal, PM13, Chaos, Dork in a Hat, Mega Trafficone. And on Patreon, we have Taiyaki Chow, Noah Wizbios again, and John the Real Wawa Luigi. Thank you also to everyone who's supporting me in the $1 tiers. Remember, even $1 helps a lot and gets you access to a bunch of members' exclusive videos. And you get shouted out at the end of these videos if you can make it this far. But thank you so much for doing that. You can check out the join button below for that or my Patreon. And I have had a great time talking about this. Thank you for letting me indulge in my nostalgia. But yeah, I hope you had a good time and I will see you all next time.